The Anibidahala tigress. Anibidahala literally means, in the vernacular, the hollow into which the elephant fell. A stream winds downwards in southerly direction, having its source quite close to the forest hamlet of Kempekarai, in the mountainous jungle stretch to the north of the town of Penagram, in the district of Salem, in Tamil Nadu, formerly the Madras Presidency. This stream drops sharply at one point. It is a fall of about 200 feet and it occurs in the region of granite rocks, so that the water has worn a deep hollow through striking the stream, over a period of perhaps thousands of years. In the rainy season, the water fills this hollow and rushes madly onwards in its course, but in summer, when the stream ceases to flow, a deep pool of still, dark and forbidding water fills the hole. Nobody knows its exact depth. Probably it is well over 30 feet. As summer advances and the heat increases, the level of the pool descends, leaving a sheer, circular wall of smooth rock all around, covered with slime and moss, up which nothing that has fallen into the pool can ever hope to climb back to safety. That is what gave the place its name. For an elephant came along one hot season in search of water. The animal came to the pool, and must have extended its trunk, to suck up some of the water. Probably the water was just out of reach. The elephant extended too far, slipped on the slimy side skidding down into the pool. Elephants are excellent swimmers, but nothing and no one except a fish can continue swimming forever. Some cartmen who were traveling along the nearby road to Matua heard the elephant's screams and gurgles of fear and suffocation. They left their carts, seated themselves on the rocks, around the pool and gloated over the drowning beast's efforts to escape. It is said that the elephant made prodigious but vain efforts to get a foothold on these slimy rocks. It slipped back each time. The cartmen were so interested that they lit fires on the rocks and camped there the whole night. The elephant finally disappeared beneath the surface, with a last shriek and gurgle in the early hours of the morning. It took over a fortnight before sufficient gas could collect in the stomach, to float the carcass to the top. By this time, the stench was awful, and it grew worse and worse as the thick hide and flesh fell apart in decomposition to expose huge chunks of rotting meat. After that no creature came near that pool for a very long time. That is, not for at least 30 years, when a tiger that had been roaming the area, and had started to prey upon men repeated the whole act by slipping into the pool itself. But that's another story. Tigers rarely remained in this area for long, yet it was in fact the bend in a regular, tiger beat, that resembled a rather wide letter U, if laid upon its left side, that is with the opening facing left. The lower side represents the bed of the China River, from the point where, it empties itself into the larger cavalry, and for a little over seven miles up its course. At what point the stream from the north, along whose course lies the deep pool of Anibidahala, empties itself into the China. Tigers were occasionally in the habit of swimming across the cavalry, and wending a leisurely way up the course of the China, killing what spotted deer, sambar or pig they could find, and an occasional heifer or buffalo at the cattle patties at Panapati and Matur along the way, to turn northwards up the course of the Anibidahala stream, skirting the big pool and climbing the hill above it. They then continued another seven miles as the crow flies till they reached the bed of another stream, euphemistically known as the Talavadi River, although it is really little more than a deep and rocky nullah, flowing westwards for perhaps 15 miles to empty itself into the Calvary River at a point maybe seven miles above, where the China River itself joins the Calvary. The Talavadi stream, of course, is represented by the upper side of the letter U lying on its left side. As I have related, these wandering tigers from across the cavalry would stroll eastwards up the China River, then turn northwards up the Anibidahala stream and finally return westwards down the Talavadi Nullah to reach the cavalry and swim across it once more to the Colligal Bank on the opposite side. It was interesting to note that, the tigers always followed this course, and never came in the opposite direction, that is, from the Talavadi to the Anibidahala stream down to the China and back to the cavalry. I wandered across this area for many years, and found it always so. I even questioned the Pujaris, who have spent all their lives in these forests, and they said the same thing. It is one of those jungle mysteries that appears to defy explanation. These feline hunters had always been harmless, confining themselves to hit and run raids on the cattle patties, that lay along the beat, if they were not lucky enough to find wild game. What came in time? to be called the Anibidahala tiger, was no exception. In fact it was no tiger, but a tigress. She would follow this beat approximately every four months. 
At times the interval would be longer. From what people living in the mud and wattle huts, along the cavalry told me, she would take a month to six weeks to complete the journey. Then they would find her pug marks coming down the rocky Talavadi watercourse, taking advantage of the cooler sandy stretches that skirted the edges of the stream where the rushes grew, and the tall clumps of the orchid, or mathur, grass, till once again she had reached the banks of the cavalry. Here, as her pugs indicated, she had spent no time hesitating. They led to the water's edge where, whether the season was dry and the water low, or the monsoons had broken and the cavalry in flood, they would disappear from sight. The tigress must have been a strong swimmer. Clearly, she had her home on the colleagal bank of the river, probably in some cave at some lonely spot on one of the lofty mountains that rose abruptly in tears from the river bank. Very definitely her mate was there too, for suddenly she failed to return to her old beat and a whole year passed, even more than a year, in fact. Then the tigress returned. Once more her familiar tracks were seen, on the sands of the China River as it wound past the cattle patty of Panapati and this time she was not alone. Two sets of pugs accompanied her, one upon each side. They were small pugs, about the size of the tracks that would have been made by large Alsatian dogs. The tigress had brought her two cubs along. It was most unfortunate that she had done this, for it brought trouble to the cattle, the herdsmen that attended them and finally to the tigress herself and her cubs. The cattle that had been killed hitherto by passing carnivore, both tigers and panthers, had been few, and the herdsmen who attended them, had not taken the matter very seriously. They could always get away with an occasional lie by telling the owner that, the animal had died of a sudden sickness, or slipped and fallen down a could or steep nullar and broken its neck. But this tigress, finding the cattle many in number and comparatively sleek in condition, decided to settle down in the area with her two cubs. It was so much easier to kill and to feed her cubs upon fat heifer or buffalo calf, than have to wander for miles in search of food, and then perhaps find none. She would have to go to sleep on an empty stomach and, worse still, so would her cubs. She knew from experience that, when they were in that condition, as large as they had grown, they would still persist in trying to drink milk from her and that was a very painful experience. For the cubs had long and sharp claws that, would tear into the fur and skin of her belly, and they had grown sharp and strong teeth that bit into her udders. Kills began to take place, in quick succession now, on almost every third day, for the cubs had keen appetites. No longer could the excuse of sickness or an accident be put forward to account for missing animals. They became far too many. So the Pujaris and other low-caste villages, who comprised the herdsmen that attended on the large assortment of cattle and buffalo kraled at Panapati, sent out a call for help to my shikari and camp follower, Ranga by name who lives at the small town of Penagram, about eight miles away. I have told you something about Ranga in other stories. He and a Pujari named Bara and I had wandered in these forests, mile upon mile, for many years, and there was hardly a corner of any of them that was unknown to one or all of us. Bira had been a poacher, and he remained one till he died. Ranga was a far more versatile fellow. Starting as a poacher, he had climbed the ladder of status to that of cartman, shikari, cultivator, and finally to that of a miniature landlord. He had attempted to kill his first wife and gone to jail for it, because he made the mistake of getting caught. Profiting from this experience, he had murdered his second wife after making sure he would not get caught by leaving a complicated lead to her uncle. Thereafter, realizing it would be far too much of a risk to attempt a hat-trick by murdering his third, he had solved the problem by marrying a fourth, leaving the two women as a check upon one another while he got tied up with a fifth. Leaving this place of many marriages for the moment and returning to the subject of the tigress, Ranga received the call for help and took it very seriously. He had an old muzzle loader in those days. But it was a good weapon, inasmuch as it had laid low many a sambar hind that Ranga had ambushed over a waterhole in summer, many a spotted deer, doe or fawn that had come to drink at the same waterhole, and many a wild pig that had been so daring as to wander into the sugarcane fields near Penagram on a moonlit night. Ranga was certain that he could account for the tigress with his trusty firearm without any trouble at all. He sent word by the men, who had come to summon him that, the herdsmen should carefully conceal the remains of the next cow or buffalo killed by the tigress with branches of trees so that vultures would not find and finish it, and then to call him immediately. He would come at once, keep watch over the carcass and finish off the tigress as soon as she had returned for a second meal. 
The plan worked well up to a point. The tigress killed a buffalo and with her two cubs ate nearly half of it. The herdsman concealed the remains under branches cut from nearby trees, and sent for Ranga. Ranga came without delay, bringing his trusty matchlock. The only fly in the ointment was that there was no convenient branch close enough to the carcass for him to build a macken upon which to sit up for the tigress. There had been one and only one, and it had been just in the right place. But the foolish herdsman of Panapati had lopped it down just to get at its leaves and smaller branches to cover the cadaver. Could they not have brought the leaves, from somewhere else? The whole jungle lay before them for this purpose. They had been far too lazy. Why walk so far when a convenient bough was to be found so close at hand? So Ranga had to look for another site for his Macan. He found it. There was another branch on another tree. But it was from 80 to 100 yards away. The range was rather too far for a muzzle loader, particularly at night when everything appears so distorted. Some of these old blunderbusses are wonderfully effective at impossible ranges for a shotgun to be of any good. But on a dark night, when it would be difficult to bring off a good shot even with the aid of torchlight the odds were stacked against Ranga. The tigress came along with her cubs. Ranga had heard them coming. Soon he knew the tigress had started her meal. He could hear the growls made by the mother and her offspring as they quarreled over the meat. That was when he pressed the button of the electric torch he had tied with string to the barrels of his muzzle loader. The cells were probably half exhausted, for Ranga said he could hardly pick up the eyes that shone back a whitish red in his direction. Trusting to luck he pressed the trigger. There was the usual roar of the explosion, the bright flash of the ignited black gunpowder, and the heavy pall of smoke that covered the whole branch upon which he was seated. Ranga knew he had not missed. He could hear the tigress roaring loudly and angrily. To reload the muzzle loader in the darkness, balanced precariously on a hastily constructed and unstable platform, was not easy, but he managed it at last. The roaring had ceased, when he timidly depressed the switch of the flashlight a second time, but now he saw nothing beyond the dim, dark blur of the carcass lying upon the ground. Of tigress or cubs there was no sign. When daylight came, my henchmen and the herdsmen, who had heard the shot at night and came from their huts, saw that the tigress must have been hit. There were drops of blood upon the ground, and later, by dint of careful stalking, they found the trail with smears, and spots of blood on the grass and upon the leaves. It led downhill and across the China, which at this time of the year carried running water hardly a foot in depth. On reaching the further bank, a heavy outcrop of orchid grass showed where the tigress and her two cubs had passed. More smears of blood upon the green stems indicated that the tigress had been hit somewhere in the right flank. There was no evidence that her right shoulder or thigh had been damaged, as the pug marks she had left in the soft sand showed no signs of a limp, nor did the wound appear to be a serious one, as the blood trail was comparatively light. After the clump of orchid grass, the tigress and her family had crossed a low thorny hill, on the further side of which the trail had petered out. Either the wound had gradually ceased to bleed, or a layer of fat or hide had worked itself across the cavity to stop the bleeding. In the usual optimistic fashion of the Indians, Ranga and his companions congratulated each other that between them they had got rid of this troublesome animal. No doubt it would die of its wounds somewhere in the jungle or be drowned when it tried to swim back across the cavalry in its weakened state. Of the fate of its two cubs they never thought or cared. It was a dark night, just over two months later, when a string of bullock carts bumped and jangled down the three sharp hairpin bends in the track that led from the higher levels of the hill above the Anibidahala pool to the lush valley through which the little stream purled on its way to the China. The vegetation was dense in this valley, and elephants and sloth bear, sambar and jungle sheep abounded. The felines and spotted deer kept for the most part to the more open forest slightly higher up the deer because they disliked getting into heavy vegetation where they could be easily ambushed by carnivore and the even more dangerous wild dogs, and the felines because the valley was full of insect pests and they hated the big ticks, the mosquitoes and, strangely enough, the tiny fleas that were a feature of this forest. The leading bullock cart carried a dimly burning lantern hanging from the yoke securing the two buffaloes that drew it. It hung just behind their hindquarters. There was a reason for this. The domestic buffalo is an abnormally stupid animal. If the lantern had been suspended anywhere near its neck or face, it would refuse to draw the cart. Nobody knew just why, 
Maybe the beasts that drew the cart thought that they were home, so why go further? With the light behind them and darkness ahead, they thought they had still to go on. Rather illogical reasoning, I admit, but maybe buffaloes are illogical creatures. The cartmen had to use them in preference to the usual bulls, for the loads of cut bamboos were unusually heavy and the track stony and steep. Buffaloes have more strength than bulls. Admittedly, to hang the light behind rather than in front had the obvious disadvantage. Nobody, not even the buffaloes, could see what lay ahead. And when there was only one lantern to the whole convoy of a dozen carts, it did not help. But perhaps it was better not to see too much, on the principle that to see no evil was to know no evil. What I mean is, an elephant might be standing just around the corner or just off the track. Ordinarily, he would not be visible at night. Also, ordinarily, unless he was a bad elephant, he would take no notice of a string of bullock carts passing by. So why see him unnecessarily and become unnerved? However, this did not always work. If perchance the elephant was not so good, or even slightly bad, he might not relish this disturbance of his privacy. Yet there was nothing the cartmen could do about it anyway. They certainly could not turn back. Try turning a bullock cart around hurriedly on a narrow track on a pitch black night, with eleven more carts and eleven friends driving them behind you. Of course they could all come to a halt instead, at least the leader could. Number two would bump into him and stop. Number three would bump into the number two and so on. Would it help? Better to keep going. If the beastly elephant comes too close, beat the empty kerosene tin in the cart behind you, kept there for just that purpose. That should stop him. And if it does not, jump out of the cart and leg it down the line of carts behind you. But do not lose your head and run into the jungle. There may be another elephant there. By the time the elephant smashes up your cart, throws one or both your buffaloes into the air in his exhilaration and then turns his attention to cart number two, you have enough time to be well out of the way. Besides, there are eleven other fellows behind you. By the time they wake up and realize all is not well, the elephant will have had a roaring time. The main thing is to save your own skin. But what about snake? Poisonous snakes crossing the road. One of the buffaloes might step upon one. In which case, within two hours there would be only one buffalo less. The cartman should always ride in his cart, not walk behind it for fear of elephants. One such cartman never kept to this rule. He had met a herd of elephants on this very track, but about seven miles further on. It had been evening and he had been alone in his cart, so he had returned to the camp of the bamboo cutters, to set forth before dawn the next morning. This time he walked behind the cart, so that if he bumped into the elephant he could fade away without being spotted. However, the buffaloes escaped treading on a cobra in the track, but one of the cartwheels broke its back. The next thing the cobra saw was the man's foot. So he bit it. The cartman walked another mile or so, reaching the Mutua Forest bungalow, where I was encamped, at break of day. I cut the wound to bleed it, and walked him about vigorously. All to no avail. The poor fellow died in about two hours, and the police gave me no end of trouble for two days. Apparently, the fact that I had cut his foot with a knife to cause bleeding was highly suspicious. Perhaps if I had done it with some blunt instrument and concealed the blood things would have been okay. I just could not get him to understand the reason. I think I have told this story somewhere else, but it suffers repetition as it has direct bearing on bullock carts that travel through jungles by night. However, no elephant ambushed this particular convoy, but a very hungry tigress did, accompanied by two equally hungry cubs. They let the convoy pass, that is all but one. They attacked the last cart. The driver was sound asleep when it happened, hunched up over the scraps of rope he used as reins, and rolled up in a coarse black blanket. He awoke with a start, to the sensation of falling through space, as the car toppled down into a nullah bordering the road. He could hear deafening sounds, growls, snarls and the bellowing of his own two buffaloes. He did not know it just then, but riding on the back of one of them, with her fangs embedded in its throat, was a tigress. A cub, slightly less than half grown, but ineffectually into its side, while another clung to the hind quarter of the other buffalo. The cart and all the creatures involved in this melee landed with a crash at the bottom of the nullah, which was luckily not deep. The cartman was thrown free, while the yoke holding the buffaloes snapped.
The buffalo that had been attacked by one of the cubs broke away and bolted down the nullah, leaving the bewildered cub to join its mother and the other cub that were attacking the remaining buffalo. In another two minutes it was dead. The cartman, hastily extricating himself from the entangling blanket, saw struggling black forms and heard frightful noises. By the light of the stars he scrambled up the side of the nullah to regain the track the convoy had been following. Away in the distance he heard the jangling and thumping of the other carts as they raced away from the scene. Those of the drivers who had been awake and heard the pandemonium that had broken out behind them had guessed that something terrible was happening to their companion behind. Exactly to which companion they did not care nor stop to find out, the buffaloes yoked to the carts needed no goading to speed their pace. They knew the roars of a tiger when they heard them. Galloping behind each other in a jagged line, the convoy bounced and thudded down the precarious track, while running for his life, the luckless driver whose cart had been attacked ran behind to catch him up. News of this event spread far and wide and the bullock carts ceased to travel by night. This did not help the tigress, who became more hungry, and she had to feed her cubs besides herself. Nobody knew it then, but her right shoulder had been badly hurt. In fact, the bone was split by the lead ball from an old, old musket. It was Ranga's musket that had done the damage. Driven by hunger, the tigress started to attack cattle by daylight. In this she was joined by her cubs, who were rapidly learning the art of killing, though the methods were crude and amateurish as befitted their inexperience. Their mother could not do much better, handicapped as she was by a smashed shoulder. Thus it transpired that each kill made by this trio of animals presented a nasty spectacle of mangled living flesh and torn hide and bone, a victim that had been partly eaten alive. It was also different from the kill made by a normal tiger, a neat job, in which the neck of the prey is neatly broken, with a minimum of bloodshed. These attacks continued for the best part of six months, during which time the cubs grew apace. They now required no help, but could kill expertly by themselves. Curiously, they remained with their maimed mother instead of breaking away and fending for themselves as cubs begin to do when about a year old. The killings of cattle and buffaloes increased as the cubs grew older and larger and their appetites increased. Probably nothing more exciting would have happened had not Mariapa, the cowherd, instead of running away as fast as he could, as did all wise cowherds, rushed to defend his milch cow when the three tigers attacked it at the edge of his field. He might have succeeded had the attacker been a single beast, but numbers bring courage, both to human being and to tigers. If you should be, gooming, in a jungle, that is wandering about with the hope of seeing what animals you come across, or should you meet a pair of tigers or a tigress with cubs, both of which are today most unlikely to happen, I might tell you, halt and above all do not move. Do not start to run away, for that will attract the attention of the tigers which, just like your dog, love to chase things that run away from them. Take cover, by all means, if you know how, without floundering about and advertising your presence. Above all, remain absolutely motionless. And never, I strongly advise you, start to follow them to see where they're going. There is a fair chance, that you can do this in perfect safety with a single tiger, or even with a pair of panthers. But when a pair of tigers are involved, or a mother with cubs, the chances are small. Tigers do not like their family privacy disturbed for one thing, while numbers definitely bolster their courage. With elephants it is quite the opposite. Leave Jumbo alone, if he is by himself, and avoid a female with a calf, though you can drive a herd of thirty like cattle almost with impunity, even if you are all by yourself. Mariapa committed the grave error of rushing towards three tigers, lying over the lovely cow, which they had just killed. I suppose he thought he would be able to save it. Very brave of him, but equally foolish. The next instant he was dead. Which of the three felines killed him, nobody knows. The End